Hello, and thank you so much for joining us today for this exciting episode of WINS, or Women in STEM. We are live at Moat Marine Laboratory and Aquarium in Sarasota, Florida. My name is Dr. Kristen Wilkinson, and I'm a scientist with the Chicago Zoological Society's Sarasota Dolphin Research Program. I also work with the Sharks and Rays Conservation Research Program at Moat. The WINS program is funded by Moat Scientific Foundation and is aimed at highlighting some awesome women scientists, technology experts, engineers, and mathematicians. Because when students see themselves represented in STEM, everyone wins. Today we're going to talk about how toxins and chemicals build up in the body and how humans and animals can consume toxic materials through the food they eat. But first, I have a question for you. Has a food ever made you sick? Feel free to type it in our chat now. I see a yes. Sometimes it can give you a stomach ache. Sometimes it almost can give you even like flu-like sy symptoms if you get really sick from food. I've definitely been sick from food before. Have you? You can answer yes or no in our chat. There's a few more people coming in saying, yep, they've been sick from food. I'm so sorry to hear that. It happens to the best of us. Let's check in with my friend Ross to see if food has ever made him sick. I actually think he's eating lunch now. Yeah, okay. no, perfect timing. So, oh my gosh, yeah. So right now I'm having like a really greasy grilled cheese. So hopefully this won't make me sick later. It looks but, delicious. Mm, well, it's so good. But man, do I have this one story for you where I was getting so, oh, Shoot. Gosh darn it. I oh am no. so greasy. One sec. All right. All right. No problem. Take your time. All right. All oh. Right. <coughs> oh, Ross, don't eat that. Oh, what? oh, look at all the dirt and germs. And oh, Ross, there could be some really harmful bacteria on that grilled cheese that just fell on the floor. What? No, it, it's fine. It's fine. I mean, you saw how fast I picked it up. It's the five second rule, right? So there's no issues there. Ross, I mean... Yeah, okay, so a little bit of germs might be okay, but how often do you really follow the five-second rule? And how often are you dropping food on the floor and then proceeding to put it in your mouth? <laughs> well, you said it yourself. I mean, a little bit of germs never bothered anyone, and, like, yeah, it's a little dirt, so that's fine. No worries at all. I mean, yes, I am pretty clumsy. I mean, whether it's, like, a really greasy sandwich like this or sometimes it's too hot and I burn my fingers, so yeah, I am dropping food like all the time, but it's just a little bit of germs, nothing to worry about. Mm, Ross, I'm a little concerned. I mean, if you're dropping food all the time and then proceeding to eat it, it doesn't really sound like you're giving your body a chance to get rid of anything bad that might be on that food after it fell on the floor. It sounds like, you know, it just keeps building up in your body. So you're not only eating the round of germs from this last drop, but the round of germs from the last time you dropped food could still be in your body, potentially even the time before that. You know, there's actually a process, this is actually a process, and there is a name for this process. Audience, could you help Ross identify the name for this process? What is it called when toxins and chemicals build up in the body? Feel free to answer our poll. We have some options for you here. Oh man, I'm going to need your help. So we're going to show you some big fancy science words. So what is it called when toxins and chemicals build up in a body? Is it A, bioaccumulation, B, toxicology, or C, pharmacology? Or so let's see, what are the options? Or let's see, or endocrinology. Oh my gosh, there are so many different options. So feel free to let us know in this pop-up chat or let us know in the chat box, is it A, B, or C? Help me figure this out. All of these sound like really fancy science words, but I don't know, none of them sound very familiar to me. Could it be bioaccumulation, toxicology, or endocrinology? Hmm, we're seeing a few A's, but a lot of people are saying they don't know. So I don't know, Kristen, it sounds like no one really knows what to do in this situation. So that means I can finish the sandwich, right? Not so fast, Ross. If you answered A, bioaccumulation, you are correct. And we are all in luck today because my friend Laura is an expert in bioaccumulation. And she is officially a National Geographic Explorer. 
So let's see if Laura is available so she can tell us all about this process. Hey, Laura, how's it going today? Good. How are you, Kristen? Good. Can you please help me and tell Ross all about bioaccumulation and why it could potentially be harmful to him? Of course. So bioaccumulation is a process that happens when we eat food that has different chemicals that can sometimes be harmful for us and our body doesn't have enough time to get rid of them. And we keep eating that food that has those chemicals and we still do not get rid of them fast enough. Those chemicals get stored in our bodies and that's what's called bioaccumulation. Wow, that is a really big fancy science word. So bioaccumulation. So we're literally trying to say goodbye to what we've accumulated. I get it. That makes total sense. Now, can you break us down? I mean, besides breaking down these chemicals, can you break it down for us? So tell us a little bit more about who you are. What is your research? I mean, does it involve dirt and grilled cheese? Like, are you coming in as my expert in this topic? <laughs> so... Yeah, so I actually, some of you answered toxicology instead of bioaccumulation, and toxicology is a big field, and it's what I study. I'm an aquatic toxicologist, which means I study how different chemicals and pollutants enter our ecosystems, our waters, and affect animals and humans that consume those animals that live in maybe polluted waters. So a lot of my research is actually with sharks, and I collect samples of coastal sharks like bull sharks, tiger sharks, all over Florida to understand how different pollutants in fact affect those sharks and their health, but also the health of the people that consume shark meat or shark fin soup. So what does like an average day in Laura's life look like? How do you go out in the field? Are you on boats? What kind of samples do you take from the sharks to, to see what kind of chemicals are in them? So I do spend a lot of time on boats, which I love. Um, I'm either in the Everglades surrounded by mangroves or in the beautiful blue waters of Miami Beach. And we usually handle the sharks from a boat. So the shark is in the water, but we're on a boat. And we collect mostly blood samples and biopsy samples. Biopsy samples are just like little samples from your muscles. So we can take a, a bit of your muscle and figure out how much of a, um, sorry, of a pollutant in particular you have in your body. So I'm very interested in a pollutant that's called mercury. So when I take those biopsy samples, I look at mercury levels in sharks. That is so interesting, Laura. Do you have like a favorite part of your job? The favorite part of my job is probably just enjoying beautiful Florida days on a boat. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And you're not from Florida originally, right? I am not. So I am originally from Barcelona, Spain, and I've been in the U.S. for five years. But a lot of my time in Spain, I actually studied how these pollutants affected terrestrial animals. So here you can see my hometown and me actually working in this mountains you see from my hometown, collecting um, samples and information from the trees and the animals that lived in those forests. Wow, so it sounds like bioaccumulation isn't just something we need to be concerned about in Florida, but it's something that we need to be considered considering worldwide. So, it is. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, go <laughs> ahead, Laura. Yeah, absolutely. No, it, it is. So it is a global phenomenon, and it just depends on, you know, how we treat our waste and how much we pollute. And that unfortunately happens all over the world, so it is a global issue. Now, being a scientist myself, I have heard of the term biomagnification, and that can sometimes get confusing with bioaccumulation. Can you tell me about the differences between the two terms? Yeah, so these are two, te two terms that people confuse a lot, mostly because we tend to use them as if they were the same, but they're not. So bioaccumulation is what we said before. It's when you get, you keep storing pollutants in your body but you don't get rid of them fast enough so they stay in your body for a long period of time but biomagnification only applies to certain pollutants so some pollutants are not only stored in your body but the higher you are on the food chain the more of that pollutant you're going to be accumulating so if you're for example a shark that is at the top of the food chain you're going to have very high levels of mercury or for example microplastics so why is this a bigger concern for bigger animals like those found at the top of the food chain? 
So it is a big concern for these large animals because they are slow growing, which means they accumulate pollutants over very long periods of time. And when we reach a certain amount of pollutant levels, we start seeing health impacts for those large predators. So what kind of impacts do you see in the animals? So for sharks, we're still figuring it out. But for other fish, we know that we can see problems with swimming performance. A fish won't swim as fast. Or for example, they stop eating, they stop being hungry, so they stop eating, which makes them really, really sick. And they can also change their behavior. So for example, they won't try to find a mate when it's actually their time to reproduce, and they won't be able to contribute to the next generation of that species. Wow, all this because of toxins and chemicals found in the environment? All of this because of just that. (laughs) <laughs> oh my goodness. So do humans contribute to this problem? Unfortunately, we do. We all have our role to play in this bioaccumulation process. So um, a lot of pollution starts in our own houses, right? So a big example you all probably know is plastics. So um, with plastics, if you don't dispose of them properly, they might end up in our waters. But I'm very interested in mercury, which is an element that happens naturally in our planet, but we emit a lot of it to the atmosphere because of coal burning plants or artisanal gold mining in some countries. So that mercury ends up in our waters and a part of it that's called methyl mercury, which is a very potent toxin that affects our brain is then accumulated by animals. Wow. Okay. This sounds a little stressful. Now, I mean, I get that this is really bad for fish, and I get that this is really bad for sharks. Absolutely. However, I guess I'm having a hard time believing you to figure out if this actually impacts us as well. You mentioned that brain it impacts brains. Uh Uh-oh. I mean, yes, brains of sharks and brains of fish, but our brains? I mean, do we have to worry about this? I know that you said we're contributing to this, but it's not going to make it all the way up to us, right? I mean, we're like not even on the food chain. We're like at the top, top of the food chain, right? Absolutely it does. So we've just talked about biomagnification and we are, how you say, at the very top of the food chain. So if you're eating large fish, like for example, tuna or eating shark meat, which is actually sold here in the U.S., um, you can have health impacts too on the long term. So if you have, for example, high levels of mercury in your body, you're going to start feeling a tingling sensation in your hands and your feet maybe even your tongue, and then you're going to start having speech problems, lack of coordination, or even problems walking. Wow. And it, and does it affect, um, do these effects show up equally in adults and children of humans, or are no. there some different symptoms for different life stages? That's a great question. So actually, we are more vulnerable to these pollutants and these toxins when we are either children, like very young children, or when we're pregnant. So the baby inside of a mom is the most vulnerable stage for those toxins. Well, this is a huge bummer, Laura, to hear that animals are becoming polluted through toxins that we're putting out in the environment. Is there anything that we can do to help? Of course, there's a lot we can do to help. And the first thing would be like looking at your own waste disposal and how do you dispose of plastic? How do you dispose of different chemicals you have in your house? When your parents or you guys do laundry, what chemicals are you using to wash your clothes? All of these things you can think about and try to make more environmentally friendly decisions. And also we got to think about how we walk around the world. So for example, if we are walking down the street and we have a piece of chewing gum and we get tired of it, and we just try to throw it down a drain, that drain is going to take the chewing gum to the river and ultimately to the ocean. And that chewing gum is going to then become a lot of different chemicals because it dissolves. So if everyone was just throwing chewing gums, which is just an example down the drain, we would have a lot of different chemicals in the ocean. So everything we do ultimately has an impact on our oceans. What a great reminder to everyone out there to please dispose of your trash responsibly and don't pour things down the drain. 
<laughs> Everything needs to be disposed of responsibly because we don't want to get these animals sick or ourselves sick, actually. Exactly. So, Laura, let's say there's students out there and they're super interested in this world of toxicology and in your job, but maybe they're not super keen on being a biologist. Are there other STEM careers that they could become involved with to still stay involved in your research, but not necessarily be a biologist? So there's a lot of STEM careers related to my work because my work follows what's called a one health approach, which means that our planet's health, our animal's health and human health are all connected. So there's a lot of work, work jobs in these different fields that we can be uh, involved on. So for example, if you want to be putting solutions to the problem of mercury emissions, you might wanna be a renewable energy engineer and start figuring out how to have more effective renewable energies instead of using coal burning to create energy, which still happens in a lot of countries. But maybe you wanna be a doctor and study the impacts of these pollutants in humans or a vet and cure the animals that are showing these impacts because of different toxins. And maybe there might be some environmental lawyers out there who can help us clean up our act politically and socially too, right? It's super important to have people in policy and law that understand how important pollution is and how important it is to actually fix it. And without these regulations, we won't be able to actually fix the issue. So lawyers are super connected to my line of work. <laughs> Well, Laura, what a great reminder that we are all one on this planet and we have to take care of not only each other, but also the animals that also call this place home. We are getting so many questions in on the chat right now. If you have a question, please feel free to type it in so we can ask Laura. But before we turn it over to our viewers, Laura, we have one final question for you. Do you have any like great inspiring words or advice for our future folks out there in STEM? I think STEM careers are fascinating and there's so many of them and every day we create new jobs in STEM that my only advice is to do something you're really passionate about because if you're passionate about something, you're going to be very, very good at it and you're going to be able to make an impact every day from your job. Definitely. Thank you so much for that, Laura. Uh, Ross, I think there are some questions coming in on the chat. Do you have some yes, of those queued absolutely. up? Yes, absolutely. So some of the questions are starting to roll in, but before we dive into audience chats I, and questions, I have a question for you. So you just said that you got to follow your passions, right? Well, your passions just led you to becoming a National Geographic researcher. This is so cool. So, I mean, I don't want to just glaze over that. So walk us through, what does that look like? I mean, it sounds so prestigious, so congratulations, but tell us what you'll be doing. What does that look like? Thank you. So yes, I'm very excited to have just joined the Nat Geo family. And what I'm actually going to be doing is exploring this effects of mercury in the health of sharks. So for some fish, we know that mercury has the effects we've said before of the swimming performance or the reproduction times. But for sharks who have been around for millions of years, we still don't know what the effects are. So with shark populations rapidly declining, it's important to know how pollution is affecting sharks. Oh, that is so cool. So it is literally crunch time on these sharks that we got to make sure that we are making the most of this to help them recover. Because you mentioned shark populations aren't doing well around the world for lots of reasons. And we don't want pollutions to just be another one of those compounding factors. Now, speaking of that, we also have a great question that just rolled in. So talking about how you got started and your original passions. So you mentioned that you first started working with land animals, but how did you first start working with those land animals? What land animals were you looking at? And how did you know you wanted to study pollutions in land animals and then pivot to ocean animals? <laughs> so I first wanted to study pollution because in Spain, when I was little, we had a very, very big oil spill. And for months and months on TV, all we saw was the images of the dolphins and the birds struggling with that oil all covered in black. And it was, it really made an impact on me and it made me really care about pollution and the environment. So then when I went to college, I was very interested in ocean science, but unfortunately in Spain, there's no marine biology major. So I had to study environmental biology. And in environmental biology is where I started 
getting more interested in toxicology and taking toxicology classes. But because of how my major was structured, a lot of the opportunities were just terrestrial. So I started actually working first with bees and seeing how different chemicals affected the pollination behavior of bees in different flowers, which is actually also super, super important, not just for our forests and ecosystems, but for farmers. So I saw that that had a really big impact on land, but my passion was the ocean. So on my senior year of college, I transferred to Florida International University and I started working with sharks with Dr. Mike Hidehouse. That is so cool. I guess you could say it's unbelievable that you started with bees and now you're working on sharks. So it's also really kind of inspiring that an environmental disaster such as that oil spill magnified your interests and kind of launched you on this entire career path on toxicology in general. Now we are getting a few more questions starting to roll in in the chat as well. So as far as looking at careers and just the education you needed, you said marine biology wasn't really an option, but you did environmental science also. So can you tell us a little bit more about that transition of focusing in on, I guess, bees and marine science, but then also, I guess, what environmental science means to you? So to me, I think it was actually a blessing in disguise that marine biology wasn't offered in Spain because it made me look at things with a global perspective and understand that pollution that is affecting our trees and our forests is actually leaching from the ground to rivers and from those rivers to the ocean. And all of it is connected, which means that I have to work and collaborate with terrestrial scientists so that we can all work together in fixing this pollution issues. Oh my gosh, that is such an amazing answer. Fantastic. That is that's really inspirational. Now, I do see that we still have a lot of questions rolling into the chat, but unfortunately, I am very w aware of the time, which is such a bummer. We are almost out of time. However, it, for all you folks out there that still have questions all about biomagnification and bioaccumulation and what you can do to protect our big one united planet, we want to turn you over to our Flipgrid page. Now, Flipgrid is a wonderful website that we've partnered with where you can leave us a free free video question and we will respond with a personalized video answer. So it's kind of like a video voicemail service. If you think of any questions now or down the road, please join us. We are putting the link in the chat. And Kristen, what do we like to call our Flipgrid? We want you to consider us your STEM pen pals. Fantastic. Now, not only can you interact with our scientists through those video questions on our Flipgrid page. But we also have some amazing downloadable resources for you on our Flipgrid page as well. So if you go to our Flipgrid website and you go to our WINS channel, you can actually participate in some bioaccumulation bio at home activities. Now we're once again joined by our amazing intern here at Moat Marine Laboratory, Allie, and she is walking you through a bioaccumulation activity that you can take place at home. However, before you take place in this activity, we want to make sure that you watch a video we have also linked to on our Flipgrid webpage. It's a YouTube video that teaches you a little bit more about bioaccumulation and biomagnification. But during this activity, you are going to make your very bottom of the food chain primary producer, any plant or seaweed or seaweed grass and then you're gradually going to be doing a timed activity because as Laura mentioned these plants are able to rid themselves of toxins but it takes a bit of time so you are going to be gradually polluting a plant and then gradually trying to remove those pollutants over a period of time and your job is to see how long it takes to remove all of those pollutants if you're able to remove all of those pollutants and how toxic does your algae or seaweed or plant become by the end of the activity. So go on our Flipgrid page, watch that awesome YouTube video. It's a really cool cartoon from some of our friends up in Canada, and then interact with our activity that you can take place at home. Now, Kristen, do we have any final closing words? Laura, thank you so much for joining us today. And and congratulations again on becoming a National Geographic Explorer. We are so proud of you, and we are so proud that you're representing toxicology for Nat Geo and for all of us. You're such a great example of everything that we can do to help make this planet a better place for the animals and the humans. Thank you so much for having me, Kristen. I'll see you soon. Thank you. Ross, I think we have a survey for our, for our viewers to fill out. 
Absolutely. So we want to hear what you think about this program. So as we mentioned at the very beginning of this program, we have a survey we would love for you to fill out. So it's all telling us what you learned about this presentation, what you liked about this presentation, and what kind of presentations do you want to see us present in the future. The more you provide feedback, the more we're able to cater our future programming around what you want to see. Now we promise this survey is only going to take five minutes. So while we have you, we would love for you to participate and give us feedback and let us know what kind of STEM related programs you want to see down the road. Now, Kristen, this is so exciting. We have closed out an amazing week long presentation. We've had so many guest experts join us throughout these episodes. What are our closing statements? You know, I'm sad to see this uh, week come to an end, but it doesn't have to end here. If you all fill out that survey, let us know what STEM uh, topics you would like Ross and I to cover in the future. And to keep up with what Ross and I are doing, please feel free to check out sarasotadolphin.org and moat.org. Thank you all so much for joining us this week, and Ross and I will be seeing you soon. Bye, everyone. Bye.